In this video, I'm going to introduce the angular equations of motion, and I'm going to compare them with something that we've already seen, which is the linear equations of motion. So on the left-hand side, I've taken just a sample of the linear equations of motion. We've got s equals ut plus a half at squared, v equals u plus at, and v squared equals u squared plus 2as. And beneath that, I've listed what each of those variables represent. So s is displacement, measured in metres, t is time, measured in seconds, u and v are velocities, where u is initial velocity, v is final velocity, and both are measured in metres per second. And finally, we have a, which is acceleration in metres per second squared. Now, it's important when we use the equations of motion to make sure that we work in SI units. Now, over on the right-hand side, I've got the angular equivalents. And first of all, I'm just going to discuss each of the variables. So first of all, we have theta. Theta is a measurement of an angle. So if we begin with a circle here, if that rotates through an angle theta, then we'll have an angular displacement. Now here's where we have to be careful. When we're working with angular equations of motion, we must input angular displacements in radians. And I'll give you a quick recap of how you convert between radians and degrees in a moment. Now t, as with the linear equations of motion, is time and it's measured in seconds. And next we have our initial velocity and final velocity. Initial velocity is given the symbol omega subscript o for original. Omega is the Greek letter w. And final velocity is just given the symbol omega. So we have omega zero for initial velocity and we have omega for final velocity. Now once again, we have to make sure we work in SI units, and the SI unit for angular velocity is radians per second. So both our initial and our final velocities must be in radians per second before we input them into any equations. And finally, we've got angular acceleration, and in keeping with the SI units for velocity, the SI units for angular acceleration is rads per second squared. Before we input any variables into equations or any values into equations, we have to make sure that those are expressed in SI units as shown there. And we'll do some examples to clarify this. So referring back to our diagram, we have an angular displacement of theta radians. If we want to determine how quickly that object's rotating, then we would need to determine the angular velocity. And if we wanted to determine how quickly it was accelerating, so let's say it was going from initial angular velocity of omega zero up to omega, as in it's accelerating, we would need to be able to determine the angular acceleration represented by the letter alpha. So let's just remove the diagram. And what we're going to do now is look at the angular equivalents of these three linear equations of motion. Now there are other linear equations of motion and there are corresponding angular equations of motion, but what I want to do is show you how you get from one to the other. So S then is displacement. So instead of S, we're going to have theta because that's angular displacement. U is initial velocity. So instead of U, we're going to have omega zero, which is initial angular velocity. T still represents time, plus a half. Well, angular acceleration is alpha and t is still t. So all we've done is we've replaced s with theta, we've replaced u with omega zero, and we've replaced a with alpha, and we get the angular equivalent equation. And that will hold true, providing we work in our SI units of radians, radians per second, and radians per second squared. Moving on then, we have v equals u plus at. Well, v is final linear velocity. Final angular velocity is omega. Initial linear velocity is u, well, initial angular velocity is omega zero. Acceleration is alpha and time is t. So you see there's a direct correlation. So this last one then becomes omega squared equals omega zero squared plus two alpha theta. Because instead of a, we're using alpha and instead of s, we're using theta. So let's look at an example, and in that example, we're going to include how we would convert from degrees to radians. We'll then apply a couple of these equations just to demonstrate the importance of working in SI units. 
So let's briefly recap how we get from degrees to radians, radians to degrees, revolutions to radians and so on. There is also a tutorial on this, so the likelihood is that you've already spent some time looking at how you convert between these different angular measures. So there are a number of statements underneath the diagram there. The first statement says that one revolution is two pi radians. And where the definition of a radian comes from on our diagram, we have an angle theta which represents one radian. Now for that to be one radian, the arc length must be equal to the radius. So we have the radius here, we have the radius here, and the arc length is also equal to the radius. And that's what we mean by definition for one radian. Now because the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, one revolution of that circle must be 2 pi radians. And 2 pi is 6.28. So there would be 6.28 of these slices in one full revolution. I've also written underneath that that one revolution is 360 degrees, and that's probably more commonly how you would think of the degrees in a full revolution. But both of those statements are true. And the bottom one is combining the two, 360 degrees equals two pi radians. So if we refer specifically to the statement at the bottom there, then to get from degrees to radians, 360 degrees, is two pi radians, then what we would need to do is divide by 360 and then times by 2 pi. 360 divided by 360 is 1 and then times 2 pi gives us our 2 pi radians. So rewriting that, our conversion factor from degrees to radians is times 2 pi over 360. That there degrees to radians. Now if we wanted to go the other way, if we wanted to go from radians to degrees, then we need to change a few things. If we want to go this way, from 2 pi to 360, the first thing we need to do is divide by 2 pi. And that would give us 1. 2 pi divided by 2 pi is just 1. And then to get to 360, we would need to times by 360. Rewriting our conversion, we would get times 360 divided by 2 pi. And that there would take us from radians to degrees. Now hopefully what you notice is that our conversion from degrees to radians times 2 pi over 360 is the inverse of our conversion from radians to degrees times 360 over 2 pi. The thing that we're trying to get to is on the top of the fraction. So if we're trying to get to radians, 2 pi is on the top. If we're trying to get to degrees, then the 360 is on the top. Now it's common in engineering to refer to angular speeds in revolutions per minute, but we've already said that we need to work in SI units, and the SI units of angular velocity is radians per second. So what we need to be able to do is to get from RPM to rads per second. Now we've seen a similar thing to this before, where we're changing from revolutions to radians, and we're also changing from minutes to seconds. RPM stands for revs or revolutions per minute. So we're changing both from revolutions and we're changing from minutes. So we do this in two steps. We use these box trails. Now to get from revolutions to radians, we know that one revolution is two pi radians. So to get from revolutions per minute to radians per minute, we need to times by two pi. Therefore one RPM times two pi is two pi radians. And if we know how many revolutions we're doing per minute, and we want to know how many revolutions we're doing per second, we need to divide by 60. So our conversion then from RPM to radians per second is times 2 pi over 60. And that takes us from RPM to rads per second.
So this video has covered the basics. Next, we'll look at some specific examples of how this all applies.